This is talk started. Hello, Gene. Great seeing you. In fact, I was just reading your it's um. Uh, I, oh, here's your link. Hey, right on. Good seeing you again, buddy. It's great seeing you. So, um, once again, I am so lucky to be in your graces. Um, I no, the way around. Reading. I've been uh, reading books. Appreciate all the content, and um, our 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 viewers are really going to enjoy your talk. I'm going to give you two minutes to get yourself set up. Um, but uh, we're really looking forward to it. Awesome. Can I do I share my screen right now and just get all set up, or does that happen only after do that. you hand go off ahead and get shared, get <laughs> your stuff shared, uh, and then I'll put you on when you're ready to go. All right. Okay. Cool. 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 Uh, all right. And, and meaning, I'm doing this just so that everything's sort of locked in. Yep, I want okay, you to lock cool, cool. it in, and then I'll turn it on for you as soon as you're set. Right on. By the way, I can't believe the last time we were hanging out, we were in uh, Vegas. Uh, yeah, um, wow. Time flies. Uh, yeah, and back when life was normal, and life is not normal now. Yeah. All right. So, uh, actually, you know what? Let me see. I think we're ready. Thank you very much, everybody who is on the other side, either that's Mike or Jeff. Um, we are going to um, just wait a minute. I uh, want to remind everyone, I'm going to do this one more banner. We're still accepting donations. Donations, donations. Give us your money to give to these people for a very good cause. Uh, other than that, it is the half of the hour and i want to lead uh to mr gene kim to provide us with information on a talk called the unicorn project and the five ideals thank you and let's go <laughs> awesome jay thank you so much uh i've had the uh, privilege of uh high studying high performing technology organizations uh for 20 years and that was a journey that started for me back when i was the cto and founder of a company called tripwire in the information security space. And so our goal was always to understand these high performers. And those were the organizations that had the best project due date performance and development. They had the best operational reliability and stability. <coughs> and they also had the best posture of security and compliance. So we want to understand what, how did those organizations make the good to great transformation so that we could understand how other organizations could replicate those amazing outcomes. And as you can imagine, in a 20 year journey like that, uh, there were many surprises, but by far, by far, the largest surprise was how a brought me into the middle of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. I think the last time that any industry is being disrupted to the extent that our industry is being disrupted today, uh, which includes uh, COVID-19, is um, uh, the manufacturing movement. <laughs> what, what can compare to that? Well, uh, with the exception of COVID-19. And, and so uh, what I think DevOps is, is exactly those same lean principles that revolutionize manufacturing uh, that allowed them to increase due date performance and increase profitability are exactly what's at play in DevOps. You take those same principles, apply them to the technology value stream, and you end up with these amazing emergent patterns that allow organizations to do tens, hundreds, or even hundreds of thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability, stability, security, um, and security as well. So, so that's something I just didn't even think possible uh, even 10 years ago. So I want to start just by uh, sharing with you my definition of DevOps, uh, which is, this is a definition we put into the DevOps handbook. It is specifically the architectural practices, technical practices, and cultural norms that enable us to increase our ability to deliver application and services quickly and safely. This enables us to rapidly experiment and innovate, allows us to uh, have the fastest delivery of value to our customers uh, while ensuring world-class security, reliability, and stability. And so why do we care about that? Is that those are the abilities allow us to win uh, in the marketplace. So I love that definition just because it doesn't actually say what DevOps is. Instead, it describes the outcomes that we aspire to. So as much as I like that definition, um, there is a definition I like even more than that. And that comes from not me, but John Smart, who for many years uh, led the Better Ways of Working at Barclays, an organization founded in the year 1634, which actually predates the invention of paper cash. And his definition is simply this. It is better value, sooner, safer, and happier. Uh, and I just love that definition because it's only five words and it is as correct uh, as any other definition I've heard. So this is actually my favorite definition. And so in 2013, I had the privilege of co-authoring a book called The Phoenix Project. In 2016, uh, the DevOps Handbook, which is meant to be the prescriptive guide uh, to The Phoenix Project, uh, was part of a, uh, a an effort with Dr. Nicole Forsgren, uh, Jess Humble, uh, the amazing team at uh, Puppet uh, around the state of DevOps support. And now Lana Brown is speaking after me, which I'm so delighted that I'll be being able to see her presentation. But I think there are some problems that still remain. 
And these are the ideas I want to explore more uh, in, in the Unicorn Project. One is the absence of understanding of all the invisible structures needed to enable developer productivity. Two is uh, there's this other orthogonal problem that is just as important as DevOps. Uh, so DevOps rightly pointed out that it was so difficult to get code to where it needed to go, which is in production, so that customers uh, could get value of what we create. There's this other orthogonal problem around data, which is that data is often trapped in systems of record, uh, in data warehouses, and it takes weeks, months, or quarters to get it to where it needs to go, which is in the hands of developers so that we can use it to out-innovate the competition. Um, and, and so uh, in an organization, in most modern organizations, uh, 30 to 50% of, of employees actually use and manipulate data in their daily, daily work. So arguably, this is a problem that's even bigger uh, than DevOps. Third, there's this strong opposition to support these new ways of working. There's ambiguity on what exact behaviors we need to support a DevOps transformation. And so these are uh, what really, these are the problems that really attracted me. And so in the Unicorn Project, uh, use the instrument of the five ideals to explore them. So in the Phoenix Project, we had the three, uh, the three ways, uh, the four types of work, uh, and the Unicorn Project has the five ideals. The first ideal is locality and simplicity. The second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. The third ideal is improvement of daily work. The fourth ideal is psychological safety. And the fifth ideal is customer focus. So uh, what I'd like to do in this presentation, is just go through each one and give you an example of what ideal and not ideal look like. So let's start with the first ideal of locality and simplicity. Let me just briefly uh, tell you about uh, the story that I think embodies this the best, which is the birth and death of a technology called Sprouter at Etsy. This is really a story about how engineers work together to create value. So back in the bad old days of Etsy uh, in 2008, uh, even they realized they had this big problem, which was that for a feature to get uh, put into production for customers to get value, two teams would have to work together. Uh, the devs would work in the front end inside of PHP, the DBAs would work on the back end inside of the stored procedures inside of Postgres. And so this meant that for any feature, um, they would have these two teams would have to communicate and coordinate and prioritize and signal and marshal and deconflict uh, for us for them to actually complete the feature. And so uh, their goal was, can we create something in the middle that would allow these teams to work independently? <clears throat> and so in 2009, uh, they created Sprouter. Sprouter stands for Stored Procedure Router. And the idea was that these two teams would work independently and just meet in the middle inside of Sprouter. And as Ian Malpas, an engineer at Etsy said, this required a degree of synchronization and coordination that was rarely achieved uh, to the point where almost every deployment became a mini outage. And so what I find marvelous about this is that Conway's law would, uh, would predict this as we go from two teams that have to communicate, coordinate, prioritize, marshal, sequence, <laughs> deconflict, and so forth, to three teams that have to communicate, coordinate, marshal, desequence, deconflict. Uh, lead times went way up and then uh, quality outcomes went way down. And so as part of the great rebirth of engineering greatness at Etsy, uh, their goal was to kill Sprouter, among many of the things, right? And uh, what they found was that the goal was to uh, make it so that features could be implemented just by developers on the front end with no need for DBAs to make changes. And so they did this through object relational model models. Um, what it meant, what they found was that in every part of the Etsy property where they eliminated Sprouter, suddenly, code deployment lead times went way down and the quality of the outcomes went way up. And so Conway's law would predict this as well because when you have no teams that need to coordinate with each other, they can work independently, right? A whole category of problems go away. And so the learning here is that it's not enough just to move box around on an org chart. We must also have a software architecture that is congruent, that is isomorphic to those boxes, right? And so that's what I love about the story is that shows how bad it can get when you go from two teams to three teams and how great it can be when we go from three teams to one team. But the sad uh, reality is that most organizations that have been around for years or decades or even centuries is that it's not three teams that have to work together. Often it's scores of teams. So when we initiate a deployment on the left and then get to a happy customer on the right, we often have to transit through 20, 30, 40 different teams. So it's middleware teams, environment teams, uh, user, uh, user account teams, security, change approvals, architecture review boards, right? Firewall changes, right? It doesn't take a lot to go wrong before we're looking at code deployment lead times measured in weeks, months, or quarters. So uh, one of the most marvelous uh, findings in the State of DevOps report uh, was in 2017, <clears throat> when we found that architecture was one of the top predictors of performance. 
architecture uh, was a even a higher predictive performance and even continuous delivery. So what are the aspects of great architecture? It is the ability for uh, teams to be able to make large scale changes to their parts of the system without permission from anyone else. Can they complete their work without a lot of fine grained communication and coordination with people outside the team? Can they deploy and release their service uh, on demand, independent of services it depends upon? Can they do their own testing on demand without the use of a scarce integrated test environment of which there are never enough? And if all those things are true, then you should be able to do deployments during normal business hours with negligible downtime. So um, in the Phoenix project, uh, one of the measures was the bus factor, uh, which is, is measured by how many people need to be hit by a bus before the service project or company is in grave jeopardy. In the Phoenix project, uh, the bus factor was one. It was Brent. If Brent got hit by a bus, no major piece of work, no outage could be remediated um, at all, right? Because all Brent was the only person who had the critical knowledge in his head. So we want a bus factor larger than that. In the Unicorn Project, uh, I think the equivalent one is the lunch factor, uh, as measured by how many people do you need to take out to lunch in order to get any major piece of work done? So is it the Amazonian ideal of the two pizza team, where that each team is uh, able to do what needs to get done without any dependencies outside the team? Or do you need to feed everyone in the building? Uh, do you need to take 45 people out to lunch? Uh, do you need to feed 300 people to complete the deployment? And so here we really want low lunch factors. Ideal is that when you need to make a change, you can just look at one file, one module, one namespace, one application, one container, uh, one workload and change it there, right? Um, uh, not ideal is that to make your need to change, you have to change all the files, all the namespaces, all the modules, all the containers, right? And that's obviously, you know, drives the lunch factor way up where you can't get things done, um, you know, if you have to coordinate with that many people. Uh, ideal is when your changes can be independently implemented and tested. In other words, isolated from the other components uh, so that we can get a high degree of assurance that our components, our changes will actually operate as designed in production. Not ideal. In order for us to gain any confidence that changes will work, we have to test it in the presence of every other component. All right. In other words, that integrated test environment, uh, which are so problematic. So, and so this is where I think the notion of composition comes so important. Can we test it and run it in isolation to everything else? Um, every team in the ideal has the expertise and capability and authority to satisfy uh, the customer needs. Not ideal is in order to do what the customer wants, we have to escalate every decision up two levels, over two, and then down two. So visual depicted, it looks like this. We have to go up two, over two, and down two. This is what a friend of mine called the square, right? Um, and you know, um, when I showed him this, he said, uh, that's actually the good case. The not good case is we have to do the return path in order for two engineers to actually work together and solve a problem uh, for our customer. Um, and I'll just say this. I think one of the best books that describe uh, this problem is Team of Teams, the story, the amazing story of the Joint Special Forces uh, Task Force in Iraq battling uh, a far smaller, far but far nimbler adversary. Uh, and they were tasked with protecting the citizenry in Iraq. Um, and this is a story about how uh, they pushed decision making down to the lowest possible levels, fully enabled them, um, and created a team of teams that are working together uh, to s s uh, solve a very important mission. And by the way, my favorite quote in that book is, the team was the boundary of which everyone else sucked. Uh, so if you're an army ranger, right, uh, that's what you think about the Navy SEALs. Uh, if you're a Navy SEAL, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, respect for uh, the, say, Delta Force, let alone the intelligence agencies. So uh, I think it's a phenomenal book that uh, anyone who loves DevOps will also enjoy. So, um, First ideal is locality and simplicity. The second ideal is focus, flow, and joy, which I think are the outcomes of this. So, so much of this is informed uh, by learning a functional programming language called Clojure. Uh, I love, uh, uh, yeah, it's a functional programming language that runs on the JVM. So I loved all the Java talks uh, that were uh, on today, uh, especially my buddy, Josh Long. Uh, he, uh, and just to paint, the, show the uh, context of this, for 20 years, I really identified not as a developer, but as an ops person. So I got my graduate degree in compiler design and networking. Uh, and yet, you know, uh, being, despite being formally trained as a developer, I chose ops as my real area of passion. I think it was because it was my observation that it was ops where the saves were made. 
Uh, it was Ops who saved us from terrible developers who kept blowing up things in production uh, because they didn't care about testing. It was Ops that actually uh, protected us uh, from the adversaries because it certainly wasn't the security people. And yet, over the last um, three, four years, I identify not as an Ops person. For the first time in, in 20 years, I now self-identify decisively as a developer. And I think it's because of learning how good programming can be <clears throat> through functional programming and how much you can build uh, with so little effort these days. And so at the core of um, languages like Clojure and Lisp and uh, Erlang and ReasonML, PeerScript, is a notion of immutability. And the famous French philosopher Claude Levi-Strauss would say of certain tools, is it a good tool to think with? And I think there are certain things that uh, you find in functional programs that are better tools to think with. Uh, the notion that you can't change state. It's the source of so much incidental complexity. Um, and so immutability uh, really was pioneered in programming languages over the last uh, 40 years. But what I find so exciting is that immutability shows up in infrastructure and operations as well. In fact, if you look at Docker, it is fundamentally immutable, right? Well, if you want to make a change that lasts in a container, you, know, you, you can't, you have to make a new container. Kubernetes takes that to not just uh, a component, but the, the system of components. Um, Every time you see something like Apache Kafka, you know, there's a chance that if someone's actually thinking about the need for this immutable data model. Uh, and in fact, source control is fundamentally immutable. That's why we get yelled at if we rewrite the commit history, because we want it to be uh, <laughs> you know, always a high fidelity of what actually happened in the past. And so uh, in the ideal, our time and energy is focused on solving the business problem, and we're having fun. Uh, not ideal is that all our time is spent solving problems that we don't even want to solve, like learning how to write properly you know, configured YAML files that uh, don't barf out uh, syntax errors for you, or learning how to escape spaces and file names inside of make files, or writing bash scripts. Um, uh, so what I found in after learning closure is that there's all these things that I used to enjoy 10, 20, 30 years ago that I absolutely detest now. I find that I now detest doing anything outside of my application. I hate connecting anything to anything else, especially databases, because it will take me a week. I hate updating my dependencies. I hate secrets management. I am the jackass who always checks in things into the source code repo, causing all sorts of problems. Um, uh, YAML, patching, uh, building correct Kubernetes deployment files. Uh, these are all the things that I detest. It's not because they're not important. They are very important. Arguably, they're as important as the features that we're trying to build in our applications, but I just don't want to do it anymore. And I think this is why I believe platforms are so important and why they are so great for operations uh, and security is that we want to create platforms that allow developers to do what they need to do, self-service, on demand, with immediacy and fast feedback which allows for the conditions that allow us to have focus and flow and even joy. And so all these things like monitoring, deployment, environment creation, security scans, all these things should be have these characteristics. And this is why I make the claim that there's never been a better time to be in infrastructure and operations. The best days for ops and security and QA are not behind us. Uh, they are, without a doubt, for me, ahead of us. I want to make one last point before I... Uh, leave this topic, which is the notion of flow. I think the best uh, treatment of this topic comes from Dr. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Mihaly. He wrote uh, the famous book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. I uh, gave the best TED talk of all time. And he describes flow as being the state where we lose, we are, love the work we're doing so much, we lose track of time, and maybe even sense of self. So that transcendental joy we get from doing the work we love, right? That is what we aspire to. Um, and so I think that is really what uh, uh, the second ideal is all about, focus, flow, and joy. So ideal is when we can implement and test uh, what, our, what we wrote on our laptop and learn whether it will work in production in seconds. Not ideal, we have to work, wait weeks, months, <laughs> uh, or even quarters. Um, ideal is we're doing trunk-based development. Um, not ideal is that every time we merge code, we have to spend five days merging with 50 people trapped in a war room. Right, uh, that is not ideal. And so here's a little depiction and reminder. I do solo projects, right? And there are often situations where I do feature branches where I can't even merge with myself. Uh, I find it actually easier to retype the changes uh, than to do the automated merge, uh, not ideal. So um, <clears throat> the third, first ideal fo uh, was um, locality and simplicity. The second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. The third ideal is improvement of daily work. So not ideal is twaddy, the way we've always done it. Uh, the ideal is MTBTT, the make tomorrow better than today, which is Google SRE principle number two. 
And, and so not ideal. Uh, I think the best example of this is the Fremont manufacturing plant in the 19, uh, you know, pre 1970s and eighties where for decades, it was the worst manufacturing plant, uh, not just in North America, but around the globe. Um, and there were so many documented instances where because there were no effective procedures in place to detect problems, nor were there procedures to tell you what to do, <laughs> there were so many instances of engines being put in backwards, cars missing steering wheels or tires, cars being having to be towed off the assembly line because they wouldn't start. So that is not ideal. Instead, what we want is to put as much feedback into our system as many in as many places as possible, sooner, faster, and cheaper, so we can have more and more clarity we can cause and effect. Because the more assumptions we invalidate, the more we learn, the more we learn, the more we outlearn the competition. And so without a doubt, the uh, paragon of this principle uh, is probably the and on cord, the most studied tool in the Toyota production system toolkit. And so it, it was amazing to me when I took a course at the University of Michigan in 2011 at the University of Michigan, getting trained in the Toyota production process. It's true on top of every work center, um, uh, everyone's trained to pull the cord uh, when something goes wrong. So if uh, I get a defective part from someone, I pull the cord. If I create a defective part myself, I pull the cord. If I don't have anything to work on, I pull the cord. And even if I don't, um, can't complete the documented steps uh, within time allotted, it was supposed to take 55 seconds and it took a minute 20, I pulled the cord. So I knew that going into the training, but what I didn't know was how many times the and on cord is pulled in a typical Toyota plant in a typical day. And so uh, I was stunned to find out that that number is 3,500 times a day. And so when you, uh, my reaction was, you know, these people are idiots. They have no idea what they're doing. And uh, I think the reason why I reacted that way was that the way I was trained as a first line manager was that I thought my job was to solve problems in my area of control without causing a global disturbance. It seems like these people are doing it the opposite way. We're taking a local disturbance, turning it into a global disturbance. And so the reason they do this is that we want to fix issues then and there before they cause technical debt to accrue downstream. And there's an even more visceral reason, which is that if we don't uh, fix it then and there, uh, we're going to have the same problem 55 seconds later. And so that's called the daily, that's the notion of a daily workaround. So daily workarounds exist in our work, uh, but because it takes more than uh, 55 seconds, it is far less visible, but just as destructive. So my learning here <coughs> is that greatness is never free. You have to pay down technical debt. So here's a story of technical debt of how it's born and uh, how we eradicate it using only up and down arrows. So imagine a time when you've been pushing to market. Uh, we have to push on features. We have to cut corners. We have to maybe take on technical debt. What happens usually is that quality goes down and defects go up. Right. And but the story doesn't end there. Uh, what happens is that the feature velocity goes down because the time we spend on defects goes up, even exceeding 100 percent. And so this absolutely happens. These are when uh, not only are we going slower and slower, but customers leave, morale plunges and engineers leave because everything is so hard. What was easy once uh, is now seems impossible. John Cutler uh, observed this and told me on Twitter. Right, exactly, yes. In 2015, a certain class of features would take 15 to 30 days. Three years later, it takes 10 times longer. And that is technical debt. And this has happened uh, to every major uh, technology organization, that they were all had near-death experiences due to technical debt. And I think the most famous example of what someone did about it was Microsoft. In 2002, after the Summer of Worms, when Code Red, Nimda, uh, SQL Server, uh, SQL Slammer, Took, uh, was taking down everything that Microsoft was building. Bill Gates put out a memo to the entire company saying, if any developer has to choose between working on a feature or fixing a security issue, they should choose security all the time. There was a year long security stand down that essentially said only fix security issues, no features uh, will be worked on. So that means we take features down to zero, which allows us to pay down technical debt, which allows us to increase quality, which allows us to take down defects, maybe not to zero, but to something that we can actually manage, which allows us to feature, to bring up feature velocity um, to even much higher than where we began. And so uh, that's the notion of having 20% of all your cycles at least being uh, taken off the table to pay down technical debt. So um, ideal, three to 5% of developers are dedicated to improving developer productivity. Google has 1,500 developers working on just dev productivity. Microsoft has uh, probably two to three times as many. Uh, not ideal is the only people working on dev productivity and builds are the people not good enough to be developers. Let's give it to the summer interns. Um, so, 
in a uh, wonderful karmic continuance story, Satya Nadella in a town hall meeting last year said, if a developer ever has to choose between working on a feature or working on dev productivity, choose dev productivity because they are using interest uh, in their favor as opposed to technical debt where interest is their enemy. So uh, the fourth ideal is psychological safety. Uh, to this, I go back to uh, the state of DevOps report. Uh, one of my favorite instruments that describe this is the Western organizational typology model uh, that does such a great job in describing uh, organizations. Are we an organization where we hide information, where messengers of bad news are shot, uh, where we cover up failures and new ideas are crushed? Or do we have a generative culture where we seek information? Messengers are trained to tell bad news. Uh, we encourage bridging between teams and new ideas are welcomed. And so uh, we love talking about um, you know, blameless postmortems and chaos monkeys. None of that is possible without psychological safety. <clears throat> so the first ideal was locality and simplicity. Second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. Third ideal is improvement of daily work. And the fifth ideal is customer focus. And for me, the best example uh, of this uh, was a picture that I took at the CompuWare uh, headquarters in Detroit. There are famously resurgent mainframe vendors, and uh, you know, we walk into the data center, and uh, at first I'm thinking, why are we here? <laughs> and I'm not gonna learn, how, what am I gonna learn from seeing a bunch of hail on extinguishers? But what I saw blew me away, because what you saw in the data center was essentially, it was empty. There were two Z mainframes, uh, and the rest are these, uh, outlines like in a murder scene where the server racks used to be. And in each, in the center of each one is a tombstone that says, here's the business process that used to be here. And here's how much we save per year by getting rid of it, by moving to a SaaS service. And so the outcome of doing this is that they were re able to reallocate $8 million from back office things that customers did not care about uh, to R and D, which customers do care about that helps them win in the marketplace. And so core is, the core competencies of the organization that create, create lasting, durable business advantage in context is everything else. And so the goal is let's make sure that we don't starve core uh, by uh, allowing context to go unmanaged. So ide not ideal is functional silo managers prioritize silo goals over business goals. Ideals uh, is when every leader and every member of a team unflinchingly looks at the work they do and say, is this core? Or is this context? If it's core, let's double down on it. If it's context, let's question if it's even work that we should be doing. So I think this is so important for so many reasons. DevOps will create winners or losers in the marketplace and our work matters. And uh, why? Because the world is changing very fast. Big does not beat small anymore. Instead, it is fast beating the slow. So uh, I think this work is important. The five ideals are what's discussed in the Unicorn Project. And I'm so delighted that the Unicorn Project hit the number two on the Wall Street Journal bestseller for one week in the business hardcover category. So thank you so much. And uh, Jay, let me turn it back over to you for uh, Q&A. Hey. Thank you so much for being part of all this. Um, it's been so cool to watch this talk again. Um, I've learned so much from you every single time I hear from you. Thank <laughs> nope. you. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we got a chance to hang out twice last year, which is so great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, I'm going to go and take a look. Uh, everybody, we've got a few minutes till our next talk with Alana. And so what I'd really like to do is know if anybody has any questions, um, we've got uh, any way for you to send them uh, on uh, the Q&A section on the website. Uh, you can also um, take a look at uh, Slack. We've got the uh, the track uh, DevSecOps channel where if you want to ask question. But um, until I hear something, I want to talk a little bit about um, something that I really uh, appreciate that I've, I've thought about productive productivity and developers you talked about. And uh, I think a lot about the, the the security matters letter from Bill Gates oh, yeah. um, and years ago. And um, I, I think about how much we, we've made a decision nowadays that productivity matters and security matters and that pushing features isn't always the right direction. Yeah, in fact, you know, a great another great example I should have added to the presentation is Zoom. They actually announced a 60-day feature stand down, <laughs> right, uh, to shore up security, right? They brought in Alex Stamos, who was the C uh, uh, chief security officer of Yahoo and many other things now at Stanford, you know, to help them, you know, do security right. I think that's a great example of... Um, 
another demonstration of, of the same principle at play. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy to see um, a number of organizations that have deprioritized the advancement of features and really focused on uh, reliability yeah. because that's really in, in a crisis. You know, th this dude he, he <laughs> don't need to be having the hardest time. <laughs> We're worrying about mm -hmm. so many other things in our society that come along with a, a pandemic. So. Um, uh, just on a personal note, how are you getting through everything? Is your family doing all right? Everything cool? Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, everyone's safe, and uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I uh, have absolutely nothing to be <laughs> complained about. So, uh, it's just, uh, um, yeah, I. It's amazing to see events like this uh, that give us such a great break from uh, everything that we've been <laughs> having to, uh, you know, deal with in our daily lives. So it's, it's great to be with you, Jay. Hey, thank you so much, Gene. I'm going to say goodbye and I'm going to kick off uh, for our next talk. But I want to give everybody a little bit of a reminder, just a little bit of a reminder.